Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Last Friday, Boeing and NASA took a big step forward with the development of the SLS. They completed the first core stage. They now have four RS-25 engines mated to the thrust section and to that giant tank. So now this whole thing can leave the assembly building and go off to, you know, do the green run test where they will run the rocket to essentially full power typical of a launch to verify that the whole thing works. And if that works, then of course it goes off to Florida and actually carries a test vehicle off around the moon. So uh, yeah, this is kind of cool, I guess. I mean, not everyone's a big fan of the SLS, but it is actually pretty cool to see four of these engines on a spacecraft. Previously, of course, these engines, you would have three of them on a space shuttle. Now we have four. And when I say you would have four of these engines or three of these engines on a space shuttle, these literally are the same engines that powered space shuttles. So these, every single one of these engines can be traced to its history uh, flying on space shuttles. They were all left over from the shuttle program. So yeah, during the shuttle program, NASA co called them the SSMEs, right? Space shuttle main engines. But the internal designation by the manufacturer was the RS-25. So when SLS was cut in the offing, NASA realized it had a stock of these engines on hand because they would be able to take these in and out of space shuttles. And so they put them into storage with the understanding that when SLS was ready for them, they could attach them and fly them. So there are 16 engines that have put aside for this purpose. Uh, 14 have flown previously, two of them have not. Um, so yeah, originally actually they had thought that they would just be you know farming these engines out to museums. Unfortunately, well, or fortunately, you know, NASA decided to keep them. So they also decided to keep six of the orbital maneuvering system pods and various other pieces of hardware from the shuttle program. They're all sort of, they scavenged bits and pieces from the space shuttles. And if you go to a museum, then you might think that you can see a space shuttle with its glorious engines sitting out the back. But no, those are replica space shuttle main engines. And what happened was the developer found a bunch of old nozzles, authentic engine nozzles that were used either for testing or some of them are flown, and they attached them to a dummy engine mount so that it would at least look the right place and look you know correct. But it doesn't have a real combustion chamber. It doesn't have a functioning power head behind it. And that's actually kind of sad because if you think about it, None of the engines, none of these engines will make it to museums. And these are the only functioning Block 2 engines. What do I mean by Block 2? Well, these engines are also known as the RS-25D. After these engines are used up, uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne will be supplying RS-25E. That's a change to make the you know, essentially expendable version. They'll cut down the cost a little. And if the SLS keeps going, they will produce the RS-25F, which is designed to be cheaper and easier to manufacture. You know, in these days of reusable rocket in engines from SpaceX, it is kind of sad to see that the first reusable engines are actually going in the other direction. For all their problems, the Space Shuttle main engines were magnificent pieces of technology. They get better specific impulse than almost anything else. They were able to function across a wide range of altitudes. They were throttleable. They provided a great deal of thrust and they were used many, many times. So, to get an idea, as I said, these are the RS-25Ds. That, of course, makes you wonder, hey, um, what were the other variations? Well, if you go back through shuttle history, you can track down the variations. So the first five shuttle flights flew with the basic RS-25. This was able to run at 100% thrust and it demonstrated that the space shuttle worked. But information from that, uh, informed the modifications that were needed for the phase one engine. That was then able to run at 104% thrust and that flew right up until Challenger blew up and then they uh, went back to the drawing board. They found a bunch of improvements in the engine and the first return to flight was the phase two engines. 
Those are known as the RS25As. Those are actually able to throttle up to 109% power if there is a suitable emergency. Then the next iteration was the Block 1, the RS25B. This first flew in 1995 on STS-70. They improved the pumps and the plumbing and they were able to get a little more reliability out of it. Uh, after that, they went to go towards the Block 2A, which was a sort of halfway step. They replaced the combustion chamber with one which had a throat that was slightly wider. And this had the effect of reducing the pressures throughout the system, therefore reducing wear on all the components and long-term reliability. Um, and finally, the full-on Block 2 was the RS25D that replaced the turbo pump design and that was rated to a mighty 111% in contingency abort scenarios. Now, of course, we know all this because we have all the documentation from NASA. And using the documentation from NASA, internet detectives and nerds from places like NASA Spaceflight and Collect Space not only know which engines are going onto this SLS core stage, but they also know the entire history because we have the serial numbers. So we figure out, for example, the oldest component is the power head on one of the engines, which is a serial number of 6008. That first flew on STS-70 in 1995. It was, you know, the very first um, block, you know, block one, right? Uh, that was paired with an engine nozzle which had the original narrower throat, that was serial number 2036, and it flew with that configuration for three times. Then they replaced it with the newer combustion chamber with the larger throat, that was engine number uh, 2045, and that first flew on STS-89 in 1998, and it flew something like 12 times in that configuration for a total of uh, 15 flights, with the final flight of this engine being in 2011 on STS-135 on Atlantis. Another engine with a split career was uh, had Powerhead serial number 6012, which flew six missions as a Block 1 type engine. It was then upgraded with a new engine serial number 2056, and it became, it ran another four flights as a Block 2. It powered Atlantis on STS-104, and its final flight was Discovery on STS-121 on 2006. Engine number 2058 has always been a fully-fledged Block 2. It first launched in 2006 on STS-116, and it flew a total of six times, five times on Discovery and once on Atlantis, and its final flight was STS-133 on Discovery. Finally, the newest engine of the bunch is engine number 2060, which uh, powered Endeavour on STS-127, Discovery on STS-131, and Atlantis on STS-135. So all these four engines have got to know each other during their life, and they will know each other intimately in their death as they fall from the sky. I mean, yeah, it is kind of sad because these are the first really reusable engines and they are going to be expended. And also, because all the Block 2 engines are essentially going to go into the ocean, we're not going to have a museum with a flight flown, you know, Block 2 engine. It's only going to be the older engines that have been built from mishmashes of parts that have been uh, put together by the manufacturers. There's not... There's a few RS-25 engines sitting around there, but frequently the power head doesn't match to the engine or vice, and vice versa. However, there is a glimmer of hope for reusability in Space Shuttle or the RS-25 engines because there's a project called the RS-1, which is a DARPA-funded space plane. It's a launch vehicle that takes off uh, using an RS-25 rocket engine, and this plane will then, at a certain altitude, air launch a missile which will carry a spacecraft into orbit. This is supposed to be a rapid, a rapid response launch vehicle. And part of the requirements was they had to be able to demonstrate rapid reuse and cycling of this engine. It's not called the RS-25 for this, it's called the AR-22. And the team behind it must have done some magic work because they were able to fire and refire the engine 10 times in a row in 10 days, which is a level of turnaround which the RS-25 never really quite managed, I don't think. 
So yes, this is a big step forward for SLS. And while for us, it may seem that it has taken a lifetime, just understand that there are actually components on that rocket that are likely older than many of you viewers out there. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.